So living on Earth isn't quite as easy as living in water was for plants. When a plant is in water, everything is surrounded by water, so there's no shortage for water to the cells. The water provides buoyant force to hold up the plant body, so not much structural support is needed. And in the water, nutrients are dissolved also surrounding the entire plant. On land, however, water is mostly in the soil and has to be picked up by the roots and moved around. Nutrients also are in the soil. Air can be very drying and plants evolved adaptations like cuticle and stomata. But most importantly, the terrestrial plants have to have more structural material to support themselves without the buoyancy of the water. Let's look a little more closely at soil. What is it? It's formed from weathered rock by the action of climate and organisms, a natural product. Soil is a mixture of mineral stuff and organic materials, and it's very important for supporting plant life. But maybe the, is there soil in places where no plants occur? Let's take a look at the different components of soil, mineral particles, organic matter, water, and air. The mineral component provides the structure, and it's to soil particles that roots can anchor, the separation of the solid uh, material provides spaces between for water and air. And uh, on the surface of soil particles, nutrients can be exchanged. And also, soil itself, particles come from rocks that are dissolving, and these are sources of nutrients as the rocks weather. What about the organic component? It basically comes from formerly living stuff that's died. And the organic matter is an exchange site for nutrient cycling as well as a source. Organic uh, components decomposing a change and affect the soil structure, the amount of space between the particles and how much water it can hold. The more organic matter, the more it, the soil holds on to water. And most importantly, the organic part of soil is an energy source for decomposers, microbes, and other small organisms that break things down. The water component of soil is very important for carrying nutrients into plants and once into plants, it hydrates the cells and allows things to move within the plant. So water in the soil fills the spaces between the particles and it also affects the air content. A very saturated soil can't have very much air in it. And for plants, it's very important to have some air in the soil because they need oxygen for their aerobic metabolism, the cells of the roots as well as the above-ground parts of the plant that have air surrounding them. And it's carbon dioxide. <clears throat> from, this, from their own metabolic action of respiration that affects the pH of the soil as well as the weathering of the rocks. Air, as you know, is mostly nitrogen gas, and that nitrogen is important for the plants and other organisms that can fix it, thereby making it more available to everything else that can't use atmospheric nitrogen. And also, methane from methanogens is a source of carbon that can be fixed as well as carbon dioxide that provides carbon. Soil is continually 
being produced and changing. Rocks everywhere are weathering with the actions of rain and freezing. So physical factors such as change in temperature and affect the internal tensions in the, crystal, in the structure of the rocks and they um, dissolve from the outside. Biological forces, too, work on the rocks and the non-living components. The plant roots may um, make the surrounding area more acidic and rocks dissolve more easily, as well as little animals under the ground grazing and decomposing organisms, too. And then there are chemical things that make soil change different act acids, carbonic acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. And plants themselves, as I mentioned, secrete hydrogen ions, making the environment more acidic. Water is a good solvent that dissolves things, and the acid-base reactions taking place there cause continual changes. So soils differ from place to place around the world, and the soil that is there is dependent on what are called state factors. Climate, the organisms present, the topography, the parent material or the rocks and minerals that are around there, and also time. Certain kinds of parent materials lead to specific soil characteristics. For example, Serpentine soils are those very rich in nickel and cadmium, and on such soils, which have a kind of greenish cast to the rock and the soil, only certain plants can grow there, and there are special endemic plants, that is, plants that grow only on this kind of soil that are called serpentine endemics. Limestone outcrops are another of these kind of um, unique soil types that arise only in certain areas. In South Florida, most of our endemic plants, in fact, are in the pine rockland habitat with uh, calcareous limestone rock. In the southeastern United States, I would say mostly outside of peninsular Florida, the type of soil that predominates is called an ultisol where early in succession, you can see on the left, the, the rock itself is dissolving, the soil is forming, and this wedge you can see here over the development of the soil is disintegrated weathered soil material. As organic matter accumulates, larger plants can be supported because they're more demanding of nutrients. And so as succession proceeds in the vegetation, we'll talk more about that later, over time, the soil itself gets richer and better. Prairies have a much simpler soil. These are called loses and often they're a little bit sandy. And then as plants grow longer and longer and dead material accumulates, there's, there's more organic matter and the soils become quite fertile. And this is, after time you get a mollusol. And this is the kind of area that Hardly any of it naturally occurs anymore because the, these provided the rich uh, grassland areas that could be easily cleared and uh, for agriculture. The standard method of discerning what type of soil is present in an area is digging a soil pit. And in a class you take in um, field ecology or plant ecology at a biological station. When I was an undergrad, I took a class like this. We'd go to different places and dig a huge soil pit 
almost like a grave, you know, five or six feet deep, six feet long, a couple feet wide, so that you could be inside digging it out. And you make the side very smooth and straight, and then you can see the profile, the soil profile, the different layers appear. Basically, there are three, well, four layers. On the very top, the organic layer, the O horizon. Then the A layer, in which the organic matter is accumulating as uh, water goes through the top layer. And then other smaller materials accumulate further down in the B layer, the B horizons. In the C layer, there are mineral particles and small rocks. And then at the very bottom is the bedrock. And you can see on the left, each of the horizons may have several parts in it. So the relative depth and color of these layers is characteristic of different parts of the world. And when you take a soils course, you learn all the details. Here's another profile with the reminder that soil doesn't live alone. There's a root of a plant going from the top through the organic horizons, the O horizons, into the A horizon. And usually there is a boundary layer between the organic, I mean, the O horizons and the A, where you have a fine layer of raw humus in certain types of soils anyway. The A horizon is lighter in color than the B horizon, where certain minerals accumulate. In the case of this one, it's yellow and to reddish brown. And then in the lower B horizon, you see another change in color where more, there is more sand. This particular profile is from the Adirondacks, a huge state park in the state of New York.